Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.15. This is Story Time, brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our many blessings, the first of which was we woke up. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. Father, we have many friends and family that are having problems today. We ask that you reach out and touch them with your healing hand and your Holy Spirit. Thy will be done, not our will, Father. We ask that you open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes as we get ready to bring forth today's stories. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Duh, Brother D, I can't wait for chapter 10 uh, of Dave Drebecki with Pastor Brian. Well, dog, you're going to have to wait just a minute. we got to tell everybody what's going to be going on today besides that. Duh. Well, you're you're going to be reading from Luke again and, and everything. Chapter 23. Uh, when we left off last week, uh, G- G- Jesus was uh, with the Sanhedrin and everything. And they just accused him and couldn't get their act together as they accused him. But now they're getting ready to take him to Pilate. That's right, dog. But we're going to start with your favorite part. Uh, except when you're reading the Bible, I, that that's my that's really my favorite part and everything because that that's God's inspired word. Well, dog, we'll get to that in just a second. But first, it's your favorite part of most of the shows. Duh, yeah, yeah. Here comes Pastor Brian. We didn't realize how many other people were getting excited. To me and Janice, my return to the majors was a miracle, our miracle. We knew that some fans were interested. After all, 4,000 people had shown up in Stockton, but we had no idea how many. Not until Tuesday. By then, Roger Craig had named me as Thursday's starter against the Cincinnati Reds. Every time I got into the car and turned on the radio, they were talking about me in the game. By Wednesday night, I was in the news in San Francisco. The night before the game, I told Janice there was no way I would sleep. I was just too excited. My head hit the pillow, though. I must have been out in 10 seconds. I slept so soundly, Janice had to wake me up in the morning. Before I left, we had a brief family prayer. All week, we'd had tremendous commotion in the house, with guests and friends coming and going. But that morning, we had a few quiet moments alone. We were upstairs in our bedroom, Janice and I sitting on the edge of the bed, Tiffany and Jonathan standing next to us. We all held hands and said some very simple words. We prayed for my peace of mind. We really had no idea how the game would go. Even when I'd had all the muscles in my arm, on any given day, I could go out to pitch and get shelled. So we prayed that whatever came, I'd have a sense of peace and calmness, and that I'd be able to glorify God through the way I performed. We didn't pray that I'd win. We'd never do that. But just that my attitude and my focus would be correct. And we gave thanks. We thanked God that he'd brought us to this point. Janice began crying. In that quiet moment, she suddenly realized what we were doing. Until then, she'd been moving too fast. Her tears upset Jonathan. Mommy, he said, what's wrong? Janice was too choked up to answer him. She turned to me. Daddy, he turned to me. What, Daddy, why is mommy crying? Jonathan, I said, Those are tears of joy, not tears of sadness, because Daddy's going to pitch again. We never dreamed that this day would be possible, and here we are. I felt almost eerily relaxed. My heart was full of thanks. Thanks to God that I had the opportunity to pitch again, to do what I love so much. I was excited, but not worried. Win or lose, I was living a miracle. The doctors had told me that I would never pitch again, and today I was going to pitch. 
just before game time, Brett Butler and Bob Nepper, two of our veteran players, came over to my locker and said they'd like to pray. My close friend, Scott Garlitz, and Mackie Shillstone, the strength coach, joined us. They prayed for me for about 10 minutes. Then I went back to my locker and put my white game uniform on my white game uniform. Giants was blazoned across my chest and 43 across my back. 15 minutes before the game, I walked down the runway, reaching the door that opens onto the field. I stepped into the glare of the brightly overcast day. For a second, I was confused. In a long, ragged row, photographers and cameramen were pointing lenses at me. The cameras were roaring like a battery of machine guns. I looked at Norm, the pitching coach, who was standing by the door. Holy smokes, Norm, what is going on? He just smiled. By then, I probably could not have heard his answer, but the crowd had caught sight of me. The fans were yelling like crazy. I began taking off my jacket, and the cheering continued. It seemed to spread up and out through the whole ballpark. I just wanted to start throwing the ball as quickly as possible. I strode to the bullpen mound. By the time I got there, the whole huge stadium, 34,810 fans were on their feet, giving me a standing ovation. Terry Kennedy was my catcher. He'd been my receiver when I broke into the major leagues, and he's a guy I like and respect tremendously. He also knows my pitching better than anyone. My heart was racing 100 miles an hour. The noise was incredible. I looked at Terry and grabbed a bit of jersey over my heart, pounding it up and down to show him how my pulse was hammering. I pointed at him. You too? Terry looked back and, with a big smile, signaled that his heart was doing the same thing. Then I began to throw, just playing catch with Terry. As soon as I made the first toss, a sense of peace blanketed me. All I had to do now was what I know how to do best, throw a baseball. I warmed up quickly, as I always do. When I was ready, I walked down to the dugout. The cheers followed me. People were standing again. I could hear them yelling crazily in the stands, Go get him, Dave! We're glad you're back, Dave. When it was time to play, I jogged out to the mound and heard the crowd noise swell to a roar. They were standing again, cheering for me. Scoreboards in center field flashed a gigantic, Welcome back, Dave. I stood holding the ball, rubbing it, looking at Terry Kennedy. I jerked off my cap and waved it in acknowledgement of the cheering. I was suddenly overcome with emotions, with all the built-up emotion of the past 10 months of struggle. I looked around me, up and up at the rows upon rows of cheering people. I have no words to describe my emotions. My heart was full. I stepped off the mound to gather myself together. I thought, now is the time to say, thank you, Lord, just thanks. Thank you for the privilege of doing this again. Thank you that you restored my arm so I could pitch. But most of all, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for saving me. It didn't take long to do that. Just a few moments. Then I stepped back up on the mound to start throwing. Immediately, I was locked in. My rhythm and balance came effortlessly from the first batter. Terry Kennedy and I were thinking together on pitch selection. It was like a picture. Terry and me playing catch as though nobody else was around. Duh, we want to thank Pastor Brian for all these stories and everything. And, and we'll have Chapter 11 of Dave Drebecki next week. <laughs> That's right, dog. Now, do you know where we are? Duh. Yeah, we're, 
we're, we're sitting in the radio station. That's not what I mean, dog. You know where we are in the radio program at this time. Duh, yeah, you're getting ready to start uh, reading from Luke chapter 23 and everything. And, and when we left off, uh, the Sanhedrin had just got done uh, basically accusing Jesus and everything. And they're getting ready to take him to Pilate. That's right, dog. Now, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And chapter 23 begins. Then the entire council took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. They began to state their case. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said it. Pilate turned to the leading priest and to the crowd and he says, I find nothing wrong with this man. Then they became insistent. He is causing riots by teaching by his teaching, wherever he goes, all over Judea, from Galilee to Jerusalem. Oh, he is a Galilean, Pilate asked. When they said that he was, Pilate sent him to Her Herod Atipus, because Galilee was under Herod's jurisdiction, and Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. Now, Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus, because he had heard about him, and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. He asked Jesus question after question, but Jesus refused to answer. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law stood there shouting their accusations. When Herod and his soldiers began mocking and really ridiculing Jesus, finally they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate, who had been enemies before, became friends that day. Then Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders, along with the people, and he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence and found him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty, so I will have him flogged and then I will release him. With a mighty roar rose from the crowd. And with one voice they shouted, Kill him! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas was in prison for taking part in an insurrection in Jerusalem against the government and for murder. Now Pilate argued with them because he wanted to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he demanded, Why? What crime has he committed? I have found no reason to sentence him to death, so I will have him flogged and then I will release him. But the mob shouted louder and louder, demanding that Jesus be crucified. Their voices prevailed. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to death as they demanded. As they requested, he released Barabbas, the man from prison, for insurrection and murder. Then he turned Jesus over to them to do as they wished. Duh. You, you, you got to stop and think, Brother D. At that time, it, there was a tradition and everything that uh, at the Passover that the Roman the Roman governor could release one prisoner to to the to the Jews and everything if they wanted him, and all they had to do was ask and everything. But instead of instead of letting Jesus go like Pilate was trying to do, they 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 chose a murderer, didn't they, Brother D? That's right. They were being led on by the council, but you know who was leading that council, don't you? Duh, yeah, Caiaphas was leading the council. He was the chief priest. No, Satan was whispering in all of her ears, telling them he thought he's going to win this battle by having Jesus crucified. But let us go on. Now, verse 26 starts out. As they led Jesus away, a man called Simon, who was from Serene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. The soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortune, fortune indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, both criminals, were led out to, to 
place called the skull. They were nailed. They nailed him to the cross. The criminals were also crucified, one on his right, one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive him, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched, and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself, as if he is really God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers mocked him, too, but offering by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, If you're the Messiah, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Does not said, don't you fear God, even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Duh. That, that's, that's one of the things, Brother D, when, when the crowd went crazy and kept saying, crucify him. Pilate did have Jesus flogged and everything, like he said. He had him scourged, as the Bible tells us, and all. And you know the Roman soldiers, they were masters of torture. You're right, dog. That's one of the things. They knew that 39 lashes with that cat of nine tails that we've talked about before, they knew that could kill. You know, or 40 lashes would kill. 39, they usually stop that. That's the thing. They they knew just how to beat a person so severely. They, they, could practically, they could practically open the skin all the way down to where you could see inside a person. That's, that's the thing. And see, that's one of the things why they had to get somebody to carry Jesus' cross. They tried to make him carry it, but he was too weak. He was too tired. He'd been beaten so severely, his loss of blood, lack of sleep. They were all working against him in his mortal body. So Simon carried that cross. And you know, Simon was happy to become a Christian. He, he, he considered it his honor to have been involved with Jesus. So think about all that. Just imagine Jesus been, here's the savior of the world. And now people are mocking him. They're telling him, come down off that cross if you are the Messiah. But Jesus knows that if he come down off that cross, that Satan would win the battle and that mankind would be lost. Je Jesus could have called a whole legion of angels down to help him, but he didn't. Duh, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, uh, and you, you stop at that thing. This this is one of this is one of those times when when someone standing up and doing what's right is going to cost them their lives. That's right, dog. But we also know how that story ends. So let us go on. By this time it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary in the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted. Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Then the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what happened. He worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. And all the crowd that came to see the crucifixion saw what had happened. They went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women that had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph of Arimathea. He was a member of the Jewish high council, but he had not agreed with the decision according to the others of the religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. And he went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then he took the body down from the cross and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of the rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. As his body was taken away, the women of Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But 
By the time they had finished, the Sabbath had begun, so they rested as required by the law. Duh, you stop and think about that, Brother D. G- 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 Jesus died on the cross for us. He, he said it is finished and, and everything. And that veil was torn. And you stop and think, when the veil was torn and everything, it was between the holy and the most holy place in the temple and everything. And the most holy place is where God was supposed to be and his Shekinah glory and everything. Can you imagine that priest? The look on that priest's face as he's getting ready to sacrifice that lamb for the Passover and everything. And, and he's got the knife getting ready to cut that little lamb's throat. And suddenly that big heavy veil, that thick veil, it just tears. Like it, somebody's got two hands and just rips it apart. And, and it falls and, and and it reveals the the empty, most holy place. The, there's no Ark of the Covenant. The, the, you know. The things that everybody knows is supposed to be there are not there. That's right, dog. And you can imagine that little lamb probably escaped from that man's hands and took off. But you stop and think the lamb of God, the true sacrifice, had just died on that cross. And you also stop and think about this. You know, Jesus, Jesus told the one criminal, you will be in paradise. Now, people say that 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 criminal went straight to heaven. We know that he didn't. You know, it was it's basically a punctuation mark that makes the difference. But the thing is, can you imagine? Here's a man. He's fell in with bad company. He's done things that he shouldn't have done. You know, he doesn't get a chance to truly repent, to go back and make an atonement to the people that he's wronged. Yet, God's grace is so great and Jesus' forgiveness of his sins has allowed this man to be basically transformed and everything. He may not have been baptized like people think that he should have been, but he was baptized by Jesus' love. And he will be in heaven. And can you imagine? He's, he's now asleep. He's waiting for Jesus to come back. His last, his last conscious thought was seeing Jesus die. And his next conscious thought is going to be see Jesus coming in the clouds. Duh, yeah, I can't, I can't wait either, Brother D. Well, you also stop and think. When they buried somebody, they made spices and ointments and everything, which was for embalming the body and all. Now, you stop and think. The ladies went home. They started making the spices. But they couldn't go back and anoint Jesus' body and everything because the Sabbath was about to fall. The seventh day had begun. You know, Sabbath runs from sunset to sunset and everything, what we consider Friday night to Saturday night. But they wasn't going to break Sabbath to go anoint Jesus' body. They knew that they would wait till Sunday morning. They would wait till Sabbath was over and everything. And can you imagine the surprise they're going to get? Uh, yeah, don't 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 go there, brother D. We'll, we'll be doing we'll be doing chapter twenty four ne- next week, won't we? That's right, dog. We'll be reading Luke twenty four next week. Now, you stop and think. Joseph of Arimathea, he, you know, for all of them to basically scream, crucify him, crucify him. He was probably quiet, and he probably didn't say anything. But in that trial of the Sanhedrin, they couldn't try to get somebody put to death unless somebody else dissented. And the fact that the Bible tells us nobody dissented, that they were all in agreement to crucify Jesus. You know, it meant that Joseph had either wasn't there when the that was going on, or he, you know, he may have arrived late, or he just didn't speak up because he was afraid of losing his position. Are we afraid today of losing our position because we follow Jesus? You know, when you don't when you don't speak up and say that you're a Christian and do what you're supposed to do, you know, we cut and we crucified Jesus all over again. But you stop and think, the Roman soldiers, they were smacking Jesus. They were telling him, prophesy, you know, who hit you? They all this was going on. But Jesus never once spoke one word of rebuke to anybody. What did he say? Duh, he, he as they were nailing him to the cross, he said, Father, please forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
That's right, dog. And, you know, the fact that they were gambling for his clothes and everything. The reason they were gambling, they divided what few possessions Jesus had among them. But his robe, you know, that was something that couldn't be torn and everything. So they gambled for it. It fulfills the prophecy that you read in the Bible in the Old Testament. This is one of the things. Jesus told everybody exactly what was going to happen. Duh, yeah, and it it happened. He he he's been crucified and everything, and all uh, and they did they did they the you know the Bible tells us that that the Sanhedrin they went they went to Pilate and they wanted Jesus off the cross before uh, the Sabbath fell and everything. That's right, dog, and that's the thing. The Roman soldier pierced him with spear to make sure Jesus was dead and everything, because they, they found it hard to believe that Jesus had died that quickly. But you stop and think, the weight of sin on Jesus tore his heart in two. When that soldier pierced his side, both blood and water come gushing out. They realized Jesus was dead. Now, the other two, the two criminals, they had to break their legs to hasten their deaths and everything. But Jesus' body, no broken bones, just like it said in prophecy. And here's the thing. You know, they, the Sanhedrin, they got what they wanted. Duh, yeah, but they're in for the big surprise, aren't they, Brother D? That's right. They're in for that big surprise, dog. Be careful what you wish for, because you're liable to get something you're not actually expecting. And in this case, we are all grateful that we're going to get something that the Sanhedrin wasn't expecting. Duh, yeah, uh, uh, and that's one of the things. And, and as Easter approaches, we need to remember to be kind to everyone. And, and remember, not everybody has everything at all. Yeah, God, God puts folks in front of us for us to have help. That's right, dog. And we need to make sure that we help those folks. Now then, let us end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for our many blessings. We are grateful for all that you've given us. We are grateful for this time of year when we remember that you gave us the greatest gift in the world. You gave us Jesus Christ who died for our sins. The Passover lamb was slain. And by that, we are now accepted and we can become your children once again. Father, help us to reach out, to touch those in need. Father, help us as always to remember that it is only by your grace that we are able to go forth each day. Father, once again, we lift up the firefighters, the EMTs, the doctors and nurses, the law enforcement officers, those first responders who keep us safe. Father, we lift up our armed forces, the ones that protect us so we will worship you as we see fit. Father, we are grateful for everything that you've given us, especially for our Lord and Savior. As we get ready to celebrate Easter, Help us to focus on what is truly important. Help us to focus on keeping Jesus in front of us and being more like Jesus. It is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Duh, folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks. Or you can email us at emtx. 3xl at gmail.com. Again, that is E M T X 3XL at gmail.com. Folks, as always, we like to remind everybody WGFW is a Christian radio station. You hear no advertising on this radio station, it is solely supported by you, the listener. Send your donations to God's final call and warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia 24531. Again, that's God's final call and warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Duh, folks, we also want to thank Safe Haven Ministries for sponsoring story time and everything. And, and we're grateful to you all for helping to keep us on the air for the last seven years and everything. And, and, and we're, 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 grateful, we're grateful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because without him, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. That's right, dog. And folks, as always, we like to remind you, if you see a need, fill that need. Help somebody. Don't do it to be seen. Do it because it's the right thing to do. 
As always, folks, this is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 945. We return you to the regular broadcast. Duh, folks, may your week be blessed.